The Lady of the Lake by Edmund John Eyre. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Introduction At the request of Mr. Siddons, manager and patentee of the Theatre Royale, Edinburgh, the following performance was composed. I am very sensible that Mr. Scott's poem of The Lady of the Lake afforded materials for a much superior drama than the one here presented to the public, but as Mr. Siddons, in all his correspondence with me on the subject, urged expedition, I was more attentive to the interest of a friend than to the fame of an author, and the whole piece was arranged, written, and copied in the short space of ten days. I can claim little merit beyond that of a compiler. Some few flowerets, indeed, or rather weeds, as the critics may call them, at the foot of Parnassus, are of my own planting, but the praise of poetic ingenuity belongs solely to the author from whence the scenes, characters, and sentiments have been borrowed. To quote the translated words of Montaigne, which have been appositely applied to similar compositions, I have here only made a nosegay of cold flowers, and have brought little more of my own than the band which ties them. Dramatis Personae Fitzjames Read by Christine G. Sir Douglas, read by Ron Altman. Alan Bain, read by Alan Mapstone. Malcolm Graham, read by Joseph Tabler. Brian, read by Todd. Murdoch, read by Tricia G. John of Brent, read by Tricia G. Bertram, read by Todd. Malis, read by Rapunzelina. Roderick Dew, read by Marianne. Ellen Douglas, read by Sarah Terry. Lady Margaret, read by Wooly B. Blanche of Devon, read by Libby Gone. Chorus and Rabble, read by Elizabeth Clatt. Lords and ladies of the court, clansmen, squires, knights, soldiers, morris dancers, wrestlers, archers, etc., etc. Stage directions read by Lydia. End of introduction and dramatis personae. Act One, Scene One, Loch Katrine, several islands in perspective, scattered on the lake, with distant views of Benvenue and Benon. As the curtain rises, the distant sound of a bugle is heard, which dies away in faint echoes. After some time, the sound is renewed and becomes stronger till Fitzjames appears on the summit of a projecting rock and wins his horn. Far distance in the chase have lagged behind, my trusty followers and my fleetest hounds. I'll fortune mark the hour when, spent with toil, stumbled my gallant steed, and in the dell stretched his stiff limbs upon the rugged earth. Again the swelling bulges notes I'll sound. He sounds his horn, a pause, music, Expressive of listening attention. Woe worth the chase! No kind response I hear. Since to your home I was announced by prophet old and sage, a destined errand knight I'll court my fate. Have with you, sweet, an angel for my guide. I need not fear the harm of mortal foe. Ellen points to the boat. Fitzjames assists her into it, then seats himself, and takes the oar. Music accompanies the action till the scene closes. Scene 2. The Bower. Around the walls are hung battle-axes, targets, broadswords, bows, and arrows, with the tattered remains of pennants and flags, the hides of boars, wolves, deerskins, hunting spears, and several trophies of the fight and chase. Enter Lady Margaret and Alan Bane. Wake, Alan Bane, arouse thee from this mood, and tune thy harp to victory's loudest strain, Pour forth the glory of Clan Alpine's chief, Record the prowess of Sir Roderick Dhu, The Saxon's scourge, my pride, my gallant son. Vainly thou bidst me wake the trembling lyre, Vainly thou bidst me touch the chords of joy. When I reflect upon my master's fate, The noble Douglas, exiled from his home, and seeking with his daughter Ellen, here, the refuge of an outlawed band, my tears unloose the strings, wound up the harmony, 
and damp the inspiration of the bard some debts to roderick's house are surely due which you forget no lady margaret no all that a daughter could require your care bestowed upon the lady ellen and from your bold valiant son clan alpin's pride the banished douglas found a safe retreat to screen him from the ire of scotland's king soon will sir roderick claim his daughter's hand and bind our friendship stronger by that tie alas his haughty mien and gloomy brow will never touch the lady ellen's heart whose vows are plighted to young malcolm graham chorus chanted at a distance till the notes gradually become louder huntsman rest thy chase is done think not of the rising sun for at dawning to assail ye hear no bugles sound reveille the stranger comes my prophecies fulfilled the choristers obedient to my wish unseen salute him with melodious song the door is thrown open when fitzjames preceded by ellen enters the bower he bows to lady margaret and the minstrel and surveys every object with mute surprise whilst is sung the following in our isle's enchanted hall hands unseen thy couch is strewing fairy strains of music fall every sense in slumbers dewing tis sure enchantment all whate'er i hear whate'er i see is wrapped in mystery pray tell me fair ones are you of this earth or else some which is you would ask true sir weird women we who sometime ride the blast to cast our spells on wandering knights like you whilst viewless minstrels to our charmed rhymes strike with aerial fingers golden harps <laughs> curtsies and goes out youth innocently gay will often jest sir you are welcome to our house and board and every courteous right shall be your due that hospitality can claim or give nor will we question you of birth and name lest we should recognize a deadly foe and give unwillingly the stranger's boon ellen enters with attendants bearing venison and wine they spread the table and ellen motions fitzjames to seat himself and eat he obeys during the dumb scene music when that has ceased ellen bain takes his harp and sings the following verse whilst ellen and lady margaret wait upon their guest song accompanying on the harp if e'er on life's uncertain main mishap shall mar thy sail if faithful wise and brave in vain woe want and exile thou sustain beneath the fickle gale waste not a sigh on fortune changed on thankless courts or friends estranged but come where kindred worth shall smile to greet thee in the lonely isle fitzjames rising thanks for your chair thanks to the bard whose strains have tuned my soul to harmony and love taking ellen apart the servants remove the table etc etc and lady margaret and the minstrel go out dear lady let me profit by the chance which brought me to your isle of all the flowers that bloom in this sequestered vale thou art the fairest and the sweetest pot is pity a rose so sweet should blossom in a wild the modest rose that on the mountain side is nourished by the dews of heaven lives out its little day to summer's life but that which proudly blossoms in a princely bower is prematurely plucked to grace a bosom regardless of its sweets and fades away by this soft hand i swear i'll lead thee far from these rude scenes where feuds and discord reign to where love frolics in the myrtle bowers near the boat castle to my horses wait to bear us swiftly on the way to stirling he who addresses you my lovely maid is honoured in the scottish court by rank the knight of snowdoon and by name fitz james to say sir knight i do not read thy heart or female artifice one way remains 
Yes, struggling bosom, I will tell him all. Fitzjames, my father is a banished man, outlawed and exiled, and the price of blood is set upon his life. To wed with me were infamy. Fitzjames attempts to speak. Nay, dinna speak, but hear what truth reveals. Sir Knight, there is a, a noble youth. Enough. I read the secret movements of thy breast, and twere not mannerly to press you more. Now, fair one, listen to a stranger's word. It chanced one day, in fight, my falcon's blade, preserved the life of Scotland's lord, this ring, the grateful monarch from his finger gave, and bade, whenever I had boon to ask, to bring it back, and boldly claim of him, whatever recompense I choose to name. Ellen, this golden circlet now be thine. Seek thou the king, this signet speeds thy way. Through ranks of soldiers' stations to oppose, then claim thy suit, whatever it be, and trust, he will redeem his pledge, and grant thy prayer. He places the ring on her finger. He is hastily departing through the door when a large broadsword, which hangs from the trophy over it, drops from its sheath upon the ground and at his feet. He picks it up, looks at it, and comes forward. Music till he speaks. I never knew but one whose sin of you arm was strong enough to brandish in the field a blade like this. Sir Knight, it is my sire's, our guardian champion sword. Ha! Says thou so? By heaven upon the guard is blazoned here, the well-known crest of Douglas. The bagpipes are heard at a distance. Enter Lady Margaret and Alan Bane. Hearest thou not, the pipes of war announce my son's approach? Look from this casement, see their banners wave, their barges floating on the silver tide. She opens the casement, the sounds of the pibroch are renewed in piano. While Alan Bane converses apart with Lady Margaret and Ellen, Fitzjames is viewing the scene from a window. Poor best yon stranger were dismissed. His presence, at such a time as this, may breed distrust. Besides, Sir Roderick may... Thou counsellest well, stranger, the rites of hospitality performed. I must entreat you to depart. A boat now waits to waft thee o'er the stream. Fitzjames, bowing to Lady Margaret. Lady, farewell, Ellen, thy hand. Kissing it. Adieu. Fast in the seat of memory shall be stored the sweet remembrance of the lonely isle. Exit. Lady Margaret, to Ellen. Come hither, loiterer, thou a Douglas, thou, and shunst to bind a victor's brows with wreaths. Haste, Ellen, haste, to greet my son with smiles. Exit. Oh. Who, through all these western isles, e'er heard the name of black Sir Roderick with a smile? In holy rude, undaunted homicide, a valiant knight he slew. But outlawed since, he has become a wild marauding chief. But you must grant him brave and generous too, save when vindictive passions chafe his blood. Alan, the hand that for my father fought I reference with the daughter's holy zeal. Roderick may claim my life, but not my hand. Rather would Ellen Douglas seek the cell, a willing votress in some convent's gloom. Rather would wander realms beyond the sea, dependent on the pity of mankind, than wed the man she cannot love. A bugle is sounded. <gasps> Alan, I hear my father's signal blast. Away, be ours the pleasing task to guide his bark and waft him to his home. Music. Exeunt. Scene three. The lake, four manned and masted barges, in perspective, are sailing towards the island. Above their spears, pikes, and axes waves the bannered pine of Sir Roderick. On the opening of the scene, the pipers on the bows of the vessels play the bagpipes, but when those cease, the following chorus is sung by the boatmen, and joined by numerous clansmen on the surrounding hills, painted in groups of figures on the sides and summits of the mountain. Row, vassals, row! For the pride of the highlands, stretch to your oars for the evergreen pine. Oh, that the rosebud that graces yon islands were wreathed in a garland around him to twine. Enter Douglas and Malcolm Graham, and Ellen and Alan Bain on opposite sides. Ellen, running to and embracing her father. <gasps> My sire! My darling Ellen! 
tell me why so long ye tarry from your ill in sight. When you are absent, oh, my heart is sad, but throbs with rapture at your safe return. Oh, Malcolm, if there be a human tear from passion's dross refined, a tear so pure that would not stain an angel's cheek, tis that which gushes from a parent's eye to weep upon a duteous daughter's head. Embracing her. But tell me, sir, why urge the chase so far, and why so late returned? The hunter's sport I love, tis mimicry of noble war. Far eastward as I strayed, I met this youth, nor safe I strayed, for on the hills and moors the hunters and the horsemen scoured the ground. But Malcolm Grimm, though still a royal ward at risk of forfeiture of land and life, conducted through the passes of the wood my erring steps. Ellen going up to Malcolm. Though poor the thanks I give, receive the tribute of a grateful heart, for every danger you've risked for me. Recollecting herself. Um, my father, I would say. The best reward that I can ask is that you now have paid. Sir Roderick, too, despite an ancient grudge, shall speak your welcome. Father, even now, there sojourned in our bower a courteous knight. A stranger seek our dwelling. By my fears, some enemy, some southern spy. Not so. Bewildered in the chase, he lost his way, and entered an invited guest. Refreshed, he left us, homeward to retrace his steps. My own alarm subdued, I fear for him. The gathering clans are now abroad, in arms. Each pass too strongly guarded for escape. The following chorus, first faintly heard, but increasing as it approaches, ushers in Sir Roderick and his martial train, which banners, etc., Lady Margaret on the opposite side with female attendants. Hail to the chief who in triumph advances, honoured and blessed be the evergreen pine. Long may the tree in his banner that glances flourish the shelter and grace of our line. While every highland glen sends our shout back again, Roderig vich alpine du, ho, Iero. Here is the best reward a victor claims. Going up to Ellen, but starts back upon seeing Malcolm Graham. Aside. Malcolm. Perdition on the beardless boy. A pause. To Douglas. Kinsman and father. If such tender name Douglas vouchsafe to grant me, list my speech. King James, that tyrant of the Scottish throne, whose ruthless sword hath lain the border waste, and whose revenge hath banqueted on blood, boasts with vindictive pride he'll hither come, and scare us from our coverts. Nay, at Duna, a host of spearmen glitter in the field and two revolving suns will see them here. Yet more I learned. Amid Glenfinless Vale, Douglas, thy stately form was recognized. Meet is it, then, we have thy counsel, Lord. Brave Roderick, though the thunder roar on high like summer tempest, it may pass away. On this devoted head full well thou knowst, the bolt of vengeance would be fiercest hurled. For thee, who at thy sovereign's high command canst aid the patriot cause with powerful bands, thy quick submission to the royal will will gain thy monarch's pardon and his love. Ellen and I will seek some forest glade. No, by mine honour, blasted be that pine, our house's ancient crest, when I desert the race of Douglas in the hour of need. Hear my blunt speech. Grant me this maid to wife. The Douglas and the Rodericks leagued, our foes will shrink, abashed like the snails into their shells. Roderick, forbear. Your speech to female ears. Roderick, not attending to him. When the shrill pipes shall chant my bridal hymn, the links of forth shall tremble at the knell, 
and when I light the nuptial torch, the blaze shall wrap a thousand villages in flames, the guards shall startle in the royal porch, and scare the slumbers of the mighty James. Ellen falls into the arms of Lady Margaret. Nay, lovely Ellen, blench not thus away. I meant not all my heated words declared. Roderick, my daughter cannot be thy bride. It may not be. Forgive us, valiant chief, nor hazard aught of peril in our cause. Against his sovereign Douglas never did, nor ever will, erect rebellion's flag. Twas I, instructor of his early youth, first taught him all the rudiments of war, and though by hasty wrath and slanderous tongues he stripped me of my honors, wealth, and rank, still with a subject's homage I submit, nay, love and reverence, my king. To Lady Margaret. Madam, conduct my daughter to the bower, for there her spirits may regain their wonted tone. Lady Margaret and Malcolm are leading her off to music when Roderick turns round and, roused by jealous fury, rudely forces Malcolm from her. Back, beardless and audacious boy, and thank the Douglas and the maid that I forego the punishment thy rashness dares provoke. Malcolm, drawing. Perish my name if aught but this good sword shall buy its champion's safety. Music, they fight. Lady Margaret runs to her son and lays hold of his disengaged arm, whilst Ellen does the same to Malcolm. Douglas rushing between the combatants. Hold, forbear. Chieftains, forgo dishonorable broil. Roderick sheathing his sword. Young sir, rest safe till morning. Twere pity those ringlets should be spoiled by midnight dew. Go to thy master. To James Stuart. Tell that Roderick Dhu will keep the lake, nor wait a groveling lackey with his free-born clan to swell the pageant pomp of any king. If more of Alpine's chief he crave to know, thou canst reveal our strength. What, ho, Malise! Enter Malise. Give our safe conduct to the Graham. Away! Fear nothing, for thy favorite hold the spot, an angel's presence, once has graced, is blessed though robbers may pollute the ground. Reserve thy churlish courtesy for those who fear thy threats, your passports I despise. Brave Douglas, Lady Ellen, naught will I of parting speak one word. Earth does not hold a glen so lonesome or a cave so dark, but we will meet again. For thee, proud chief, our next encounter may be mortal. Douglas and Lady Margaret lead off Ellen on one side, as Malcolm retires on the opposite to music. Now, kinsmen, clansmen, and my trusty friends, ere yet the cross of fire shall take its road, with prompt dispatch the ritual prepare. But first... To Melisse. Bid Brian, the recluse, attend. A man he is, whose wandering brains and mind, fevered by pondering on the magic page of Kabbalah and spells, in horror wrapped, for days will stare upon the cataract, to watch the fancied river demon rise. A monk he is of savage form, whose heart would e'en on human sacrifice delight. Enter Malise, conducting Brian, who holds in his hand a cross of you. Roderick and his attendants bow to him. Music. A heap of withered boughs be piled, Of juniper and rowan wild, Mingled with shivers from the oak, Rent by the lightning's recent stroke. The men raise an altar, And then with torches kindle the pile. Music. Brian, holding up the cross. Woe to the clansmen, who shall view This symbol of sepulchral hue, Forgetful that its branches grew, Where weep the heavens their holiest dew, On Alpine's dwelling low. Woe to the traitor, woe! Woe, woe to, to the, the traitor, traitor. Woe. woe! Brian speaking, during the chorus, Having lighted the cross at the altar. 
Woe to the wretch who fails to rear at this dread sign the ready spear. Sunk be his home in embers red, and cursed be the meanest shed that e'er shall hide the houseless head we doom to want and woe. Woe to the traitor! Woe! woe. During the chorus, Brian, having quenched the fire of the cross in a vessel of blood placed at the foot of the altar, Roderick, with impatience, snatches it from his hand and delivers it to Melise. Speed, Melies, speed. With fleetest feet be gone, and bear this charmed cross. Speed, Melies, speed. Exit Melise. Herald of battle, fate, and fear, stretch onward in thy fleet career, for danger, death, and warrior deed are in thy course. Speed, Melise, speed. The curtain falls. End of the first act. Act two of The Lady of the Lake by Edmund John Eyre. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act two, scene one, the mountains a cataract and a rude bridge thrown across a deep glen on one side of the stage roderick wrapped in his plaid is seated by a watch fire his men slumbering on the ground on the hills at different points are other watch fires with sentinels stationed near them brian stands on the summit of a huge cliff by degrees day dawns the moment that the sun appears above the most distant mountain in the perspective the sentinels blow their horns when Roderick and his followers start up, music expressive of the whole scene. Roderick, turning where Brian stands. See, where amidst the rocks and roar of stream, that fiend-begotten monk his augury tries. And now, slow gliding through the morning's mist, he comes to speak the oracle of fate. Roderick runs to the mountain and assists the hermit to descend, Music till they have reached the front of the stage. Roderick, for man endowed with mortal life, whose cloud of sentient clay feels feverish pang, tis hard for such a one with trembling hand to draw the curtain of futurity. Yet witness for me every quaking limb, my sunken eyeballs, my slackened pulse. What harrowing anguish for my chief I've borne, the ghastly shapes that sought my stony couch no human tongue to earthly ear must tell. At length, in characters of living flame, not spoken words, but branded on my soul, the faithful answer came. Who first shall spill the foremost foeman's life? That party shall be victors in the fight. Thanks, Brian, for thy prophecy is good. Clan Alpine never yet in battle fought, but our first broadswords drank the blood of foes. A surer victim to my augury, self-offered, comes a willing sacrifice. Last eve, as I sat musing in my cave, a stranger, in a hunting suit of green, inquired the path to Stirling. From the south, deeming he came a spy upon our land, I sought Red Murdoch, bribed him for his guide. E'en now, from yonder hill, the wanderers, climbing the mountain's awful precipice, I viewed. Soon will the clansmen lifted steel the traitor stab, then hurl him down the steep to glut the famished eagles. Exit. Enter Melise. Speak, Melise. Quick, say, what tidings bringst thou of the foe? Tis certain that a band, led on by Mar, and strengthened by the banner of Moray, comes onward like a dark and gathering cloud. By Alpine's soul, I like thy tidings well. Within Loch Katrine's gorge will waste the foe. There each will battle for his household fire. Father for child, and son for sire will fight. Lover for maid beloved. Ah, Ellen, why should the remembrance of thy scorn Wiping away a tear. No. No. Twas but the breeze of morning, wet with dew, which damped the hero's cheek. Each to his post. 
the pibroch sound, and let the bands advance. Nor doubt, nor terror can that soul appall where waves the banner of Clan Alpine's chief. Exunt to the sounds of the pibroch. Blanche, the maniac, sings within. They bid me sleep, they bid me pray, they say my brain is warped and wrung. Enters, worn and wasted, in tattered garments, upon her head, wreaths of broom, and bearing in her hand a plume of eagle's feathers, continuing the song. I cannot sleep on highland bray, I cannot pray in highland tongue. Oh, could I hear my native Devon's tides, so sweetly would I rest, would supplicate that heaven would close my wretched, wretched days. Sighing deeply, sings, Tis thus my hair they bade me braid, they bade me to the church repair. It was my bridal morn, they said, and my true love would meet me there. Exit. Enter over the bridge to music, Fitzjames and Murdoch. When Fitzjames is near the centre of the bridge, Murdoch draws his dirk and is on the point of stabbing Fitzjames in the back, when Blanche appears on a projecting rock facing them and screams. Murdoch drops his dirk into the abyss. Blanche stares wildly on Fitzjames, then, viewing Murdoch, she screams again and runs away, Fitzjames following her and afterwards Murdoch, who, by his gestures, threatens vengeance upon both. The music continues till the characters appear upon the stage. Enter Fitzjames, Murdoch, and Blanche. Blanche, singing. Ah, woe betide the cruel guile that drowned in blood the morning smile, and woe betide the fairy dream. I only wake to sob and scream. Who is this maid forlorn? What means her lay? Tis Blanche of Devon, a crazed lowland maid, taken captive on the morn she was a bride, when bold Sir Roderick foraged Devon's banks. The saucy bridegroom some resistance dared, and fell beneath our chieftain's conquering sword. I marvel much that she is now at large, hence brainsick fool. Raising his bow to strike her. Dare strike her but one blow, I'll pitch thee bastard headlong down the gulf. Her sex demands respect, her woes thy pity. Thanks, champion, thanks. Oh, thou art kind indeed. See, holding up the plume of feathers. See, with these grey pennons I will sail, and seek my true love in the air. But mark, I will not give that savage knave one plume to break his fall. No, deep amid the rocks the wolves and kites shall batten on his bones. Hush thee, poor sorrowing maiden, and be still. Oh, thou speakest kindly, and I'll rave no more. The fever of my brain has dried mine eyes, but still they love the Lincoln green. Mine ear still loves the lowland tongue. Sings. For, oh, my sweet William was forester true. He stole poor Blanche's heart away. His coat was all of the green wood hue, and so blithely he trilled the lowland lay. It was not that I meant, but thou art wise and guessest well. Drawing Fitzjames apart, she looks wildly over the glen, and fixes an apprehensive eye upon the clansman, then, in low, broken, and hurried accents, sings the following ballad. The toils are pitched, and the stakes are set, the bows they bend, and the knives they wet. It was a stag, a stag of ten, he came stately down the glen, ever sing heartily, heartily. It was there he met with a wounded doe, she warned him of the toils below. He had an eye, and he could heed. He had a foot, and he could speed. Hunters watch so narrowly. Murdoch whoops aloud and whistles. Blanche shrieks. Murdoch, was that a signal cry? I, I shout to scare yon raven, hence. Fitzjames aside. The maniac's song, and Murdoch's shout. Suspicion breed. Disclose drawing his sword. Thy treachery, knave, or thou shalt quickly die. Murdoch springs upon Fitzjames and seizes his sword. They struggle. Fitzjames is thrown down. Murdoch runs up the rocks and appears on the bridge, draws his bow and shoots Blanche with an arrow, who, affrighted, has ran towards the gulf. Fitzjames recovers himself and pursues Murdoch. Blanche comes forward with the arrow piercing her breast and sinks down upon a bank beneath a tree. 
At that moment, Fitzjames appears upon the bridge, disarms Murdoch, who then aims an arrow at Fitzjames, who with his sword cuts the bow of Murdoch in twain, stabs him, and throws him off the bridge into the yawning chasm. Music the whole time, till Fitzjames runs to Blanche, and appears endeavouring to staunch the blood. Enter Fitzjames. Blanche, having withdrawn the shaft. Stranger, tis vain, the life stream ebbs apace, the power of reason at this hour of death after lapse of many cheerless years returns and helpless injured wretch i die and something tells me in thy pitying looks thou wilt be the avenger of my wrongs o oh, speak thy dying wish and here i swear to execute whatever boon you crave seest thou this little tress of yellow hair i have worn it as my heart's dear pride through every danger, frenzy, and despair. It once was bright and clear as thine, but blood and tears have dimmed it, putting it in his hand. But now it shall wave upon thy helmet, till the sun and rain have bleached the sanguine dye. O oh, heaven more strong, let reason beam her light upon my soul. Let me conjure thee by that honoured sign, the knighthood's badge, and for thy life preserved, when thou shalt see a man of gloomy brow, who boasts himself the chief of Alpine's clan, be firm at thy hand, thy heart and weapon bold, and with his blood revenge poor Blanche's wrongs. Fitzjames, placing the lock of hair on the side of his bonnet. May heaven forsake me in my hour of need, if on this outlawed chieftain, murdered maid, I do not wreak thy injuries. That pang! The soul's departure from its earthly tenement forewarns. Ere yet my fleeting breath expire. Be warned. They watch for thee on hill and glen. Avoid the pass. Oh, mercy heaven. Farewell. Dies. By him whose sacred word is truth, I wow. No other favour save this waving curl. I'll wear till this tad token shall be steeped in the best blood of Roderick Dhu. Distant halloos and whistles are heard. But hark, my path like bloodhounds they pursue. E'en here I'll bide, if farther through the wilds I stray, I fall upon the foe. The atmosphere is darkened, the wind howls, and the rain descends. The tempest roars. I'll seek some tufted shelter in the vale, to screen me from the beating wind and rain. There couch me till the night, then, darling, try my dangerous way. The halloos and whistles are heard again. The chase is up. They'll find the hunted lion is a dangerous foe. Exit. Scene two. Another view of the highlands. The storm continues with unabating fury. Enter Fitzjames. Benubed and drenched with rain, fatigued and faint, famished and chilled, I cannot journey on. Enter Roderick Jew, wrapped in his plaid. Roderick. What ho? Who goes there? Stand, and speak thy name, and purpose. What art thou? A mountaineer. No parley, Saxon. What dost thou require? The stranger's privilege to ask of you. Rest and a guide, some nourishment and fire. My path is lost. The gale has chilled my limbs. My life's beset. Art thou a friend to Roderick? No. Thou darest not own thyself his enemy. I dare to him and all his murderous band. Bold words. Stranger, I am Roderick Dhu, a clansman born, and every word thou speakest against his honour should unsheath my blade. Yet more. Tis said a mighty augury is laid upon thy fate. If I but wind this horn, thou art by numbers overcome. Worn as thou art, in single combat too, an easy conquest thou wouldst prove. But no, ne'er from the laws of honour will I swerve. T'were shame to battle with a wearied man, and stranger is a passport to the heart. Come in, and rest thee. Take some food and fire. And when the clouds disperse, the day is clear, till past Clan Alpine's utmost guard, myself will guide thee on the way. 
Thanks, mountaineer. I take thy courtesy, and do accept a soldier's welcome and a soldier's fare. Exeunt. Scene three, the bower. Enter Ellen and Allenbing. Dear lady, he'll return, with joy return. He will, he must. He has but distant strayed to seek some refuge, ere the dogs of war shall hunt us from the covert we've gained. No, Alan, no. Thine is a weak pretext, when in such tender tone and piteous look Douglas a part in blessing gave me. Then I read the purpose of his manly breast. My soul, though feminine, can image his. He hears reports of battles, deems himself the cause of strife, and now to Stirling highs to yield his person to the Scottish king, and buy Sir Roderick's safety with his own. Nay, lovely Ellen, dearest maid, forbear. What charm can mitigate a daughter's grief? What words can stop the current of her eyes when they bewail a loved parent lost? Amidst the din of war I'll seek the king. These feet no rest, nor sleep these eyelids close, till at a monarch's throne I pour my plaint, till mercy breathe her accent in my ear, or in his dungeon perish with my sire. Exit. Shall I, the minstrel of my master's house, refuse to share his doom? In weal or woe my harp shall glad him, and shall soothe his cares, nor ever leave him till it pour the verse in funeral dirges o'er his hallowed grave. Exit. Scene four. The pass of Bin Lead. Dwarfish shrubs of birch, oak, etc. clothe the tops and sides of the mountain. Osiers are growing on the swamp and on the banks of the river, the storm over. Enter Roderick and Fitzjames. What lover's errand, or what stronger cause, permit me now to ask, could tempt your steps to seek these western wilds, no traveller treads without a pass from Roderick Dhu. Brave Gael, my pass is in my baldric by my side, a knight's free footsteps fearless wander far. A falcon flown, the glance of highland maid, will oft suffice to cheat us of our time. Enough. Thy secret keep. I urge thee not. But, stranger, if on peaceful errand bent, whence the bold boast, affirmed with martial tone, that you were Roderick's vowed and mortal foe? Warrior, but yesternoon, not of your chief, I knew, save as an outlawed, desperate man, who in the regent's presence, in his court, with ruffian dagger, stabbed a gallant knight. Hurtst thou the provocation that he gave? Heardst thou what shameful word, degrading blow, brought Roderick's vengeance down? What wrecked the chief, if upon highland heath, or holy rood he stood? He writes his wrongs where error given. What is your other cause gainst Roderick do? What deem ye of my pathway laid, my life meanly beset by cowardly surprise? As of a punishment to rashness do. Hadst thou sent friendly warning to our chief, I seek a hound that strayed, or falcon flown, or come to frolic with a mountain lass. Free hadst thou been to enter and depart, but secret path, sir knight, shows secret foe. Not as a spy, thy death was doomed unheard, but to fulfil a prophet's augury. Well, let it pass, I will no longer now. Fresh causes of my enmity proclaim, to chafe thy mood, I am by promise bound, to match me with this chieftain of your clan, once I have sought your alpine wilds in peace. But when I come its visitor again, I come with banner, brand, and deadly bow, as leader seeks his mortal enemy. Never did love lorn swain in lady's bower pant with more rapture for the pointed time, as I, until before me stand in view, this rebel chieftain, and his lawless band. Have then thy wish. He whistles, the signal is answered from the surrounding hills, when on a sudden spring up, on the right and left hands, above and below from the shingles, from the bushes, heath, and willows, armed warriors, who bend their bows, 
when they appear there is a crash of warlike instruments fitzjames starts roderick with an air of exultation points to his followers how sayest thou now these stranger are clan alpine's warriors bold and saxon mark me i am roderick dhu fitzjames placing his back against a rock and drawing his sword come come all for sooner shall this rock from its firm base be moved as i fear not he waves his hand and the clansmen disappear to the crash of warlike music thou art my guest i pledged my sacred word to bring thee safe beyond our boundaries not for the wealth of all your southern vales would i betray my charge i only meant to show how weak the reed on which you lent and that your journey was impossible without a pass from me now move we on a few short paces hence we pass the ford that lands us at bow castle onwards sir Exeunt. scene four a view on loch Vinacar, near coilantogel fort enter roderick and fitzjames bold saxon to his promise just and true Veach Alpine has discharged his word. This man, this murderous chief, this outlawed, desperate man, hath led thee safe through every pass and watch, far past the limits of Clan Alpine's guard. Throwing down his target. See here. All vantageless I stand. Behold, armed, like yourself, with single sword, opposed now man to man and steel to steel we'll try whenever foreman bade me draw my blade i never shrunk back nay more i wowed thy death yet sure thy fair and generous faith to me and the deep debt i owe for life preserved deserve a better meed can naught but blood our feud atone no stranger none and here to fire thy flagging valour wet thy sword the saxon cause and mine rests on thy steel for thus spoke fate her fixed and sure decree who first shall spill the foremost foeman's life that party shall be victors in the fight now by the rood the riddle is resolved for in your break beneath the nodding cliff cold stiff and motionless red murdoch lies then breathe there yield to fate and not to me to thee because a wretched kern ye slew does thy presumption soar so high a flight homage to thee to thee from roderick do never he yields not he to men nor fate thou addest fuel to my burning rage my clansman's blood cries out for deep revenge not yet prepared by heaven i change my thought and hold thee light thou art some carpet knight who ill deserve the courtesy i showed and whose best boast is but to wear that braid cut from the tresses of his mistress ha i thank thee roderick for the potent word it stirs the hero and it nerves my heart for I have deeply sworn this braid to steep in the best blood that channels in thy veins, and think not that by thee alone, proud chief, the laws of honourable courtesy are shewn, though not from corpse or heath or wood. Spring at my whistle, a whole abuscade, yet let me give this horn one single blast. Numbers would rush to overpower thy arm, but fear not, doubt not, for I trust my cause to heaven and to my single sword alone. Music, they fight. Fitzjames disarms Roderick and throws him on his knee. Now yield thee, O my sword shall pierce thy heart. Let recreants yield and supplicate for life. Thy threats, thy mercy, I defy. He springs forward and seizes Fitzjames by the throat. Music. Fitzjames is overpowered, and Roderick, planting his knee upon his breast, keeps him undermost. He draws his dagger, which he raises to stab Fitzjames, when, exhausted with fatigue and loss of blood, he falls prostrate on the earth, and the weapon is sheathed in the ground. 
Fitzjames rises on his knee and returns thanks to heaven for his preservation. Music till the curtain falls. End of the second act. Act Three of The Lady of the Lake by Edmund John Eyre. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Three, Scene One The Guard Room. Soldiers of a fierce and bearded aspect are variously grouped. Some are sleeping on the floor and bench. John of Rent and others are carousing round a large oaken table in the centre. Others are warming themselves before a huge chimney's dying embers. Swords, halberds, spears, bows and arrows, helmets and breastplates cover the walls. The room is lighted by two flaming torches, placed in iron brackets fastened in the walls. On the rising of the curtain, a long roll of drums without. John of Brent Hark, comrades, to the drums, whose rolling beats tell that the sun is up. Sluggards, arise! nor let his beams peep through the narrow loops and catch ye snoring up up ye slumberers they rise rub their eyes and gape stretch wide your portals garrison your mouths with haunch of venison and cups of sack giving them wine renew the bowl and sing a merry catch and like true brethren of the brand and spear join in the buxom chorus song and chorus our vicar still preaches that Peter and Paul laid a swinging long curse on the bonny brown bowl, that there's wrath and despair in the jolly black jack, and the seven deadly sins in a flagon of sack. Yet whoop, Barnaby, off with thy liquor, drink up seas out, and a fig for the vicar. Yet whoop, Barnaby, off with thy liquor, drink up seas out, and a fig for the vicar. Our vicar, he calls it damnation to sip the ripe ready dew of a woman's dear lip, says that Belzebub lurks in her kerchief so sly, and Apollyon shoots darts from her merry black eye. Yet whoop, Jack, kiss Jillian the quicker, till she bloom like a rose and a fig for the vicar. Yet whoop, Jack, kiss Jillian the quicker, till she bloom like a rose and a fig for the vicar. The merriment is interrupted by the warder's horn without. John of Brent rises, goes to the side, and looks out. Here is old Bertram, bully, sons of Mars, and beat for jubilee the rattling drum, in company with minstrel and a maid. Enter Bertram, Alan Bane, and Ellen, whose face and figure are concealed by her plaid. She shrinks back with dread at the sight of the place and ferocity of the soldiery. John of Brent and the rest crowd round Bertram, and vociferate in a breath what, what news what news ye stun me with your clamorous tongues i only know from noon to eve we fought with enemy as wild untamable as the rude mountains where they spring and grow not much success can either party boast but whence thy captives soldier for such spoils as theirs must need reward thy warfare well the times grow sharp, and age creeps on thee fast. Now thou hast got an harp, and dancing girl, get but an ape, and thou mayst trudge the land, a strolling leader of a juggler train. No, comrade, no such fortune is my lot. The battle ended, these two sought our lines, and having audience of the noble Mar, he bade me bring them hitherward with speed. Forbear your noisy mirth and ruder jests, for none shall shame or harm them as I live. Hear ye his boast. Look at the old gallant. Shall he strike doe beside our very lodge, and grudge to pay the forester his fee? Despite of Mar or thee, I'll have my share. Going rudely to seize Ellen, Bertram and Alan oppose him, but she, rushing between them, lets fall her tartan screen. John of Brent and the other soldiers, amazed, stand gazing on her. Warriors, my father was the soldier's friend, cheered him in camps, in marches led the way, and with him in the battle often bled. Oh, never from the valiant or the brave should a poor exile's daughter suffer wrong. Lady, I shame me of the part I played. And thou, poor girl, an outlaw's daughter? Well, I am an outlaw by our forest laws, 
and my poor Rose, if Rose be living now, wiping away a tear, must bear such age, I think, as thine. Comrades, I go to call the captain of our guard. There lies my halbert on the floor. Throwing it down. And mark, he that dares leap that barrier, hear me, knaves, to do that lovely maiden injury, shall feel the javelin in his heart. Beware, no joking, laughter, ribaldry, or noise, be men, be soldiers, you know John of Brent. Exit. Ellen, apart to Allenbane. Soon, haply, of the Douglas I shall hear, soon may my eyes behold him and my ears dwell on the sweetest tones of harmony, the sounds that issue from a parent's voice. If once again my vision sight prove true, the bleeding heart of Douglas shall be seen, the brightest crest that glitters in the court, the firmest banner in the fields of war. Enter John of Brent. I told young Lewis, that's the captain's name, no Briton but a Frenchman born, that you would fain have parley with him straight. He said, as soon as he had let his ringlets loose, curled his moustaches, and perfumed his hair, that you might wait upon him, lady. A voice from a room above sings the following strain. Ellen and Allenbane look at each other as though they recognized the songster. I hate to learn the ebb of time from yon dull steeple's drowsy chime, on market as the sunbeams crawl, inch after inch along the wall. These towers, although a king's they be, have not a hall of joy for me. Ellen, apart to Alan Bain. Oh, Alan, tis he, or were my ears deceived? Thus all the day and through the live-long night the captive in the tower above will sing. I verily believe his brain is crazed by love of some proud jilting maid. Poor youth, his cares will soon be ended. What say you? Will he obtain his liberty, be free? The freedom of a felon will be his, to walk from out the prison to his grave. Ellen, with great energy. A grave! It cannot be. He's innocent. Twere well to prove it to his sovereign, then. The youth is Malcolm Graham, a royal ward. No mercy will be shown him, and his head will pay the rashness of his heels, which dared to ramble like a traitor to the foe, to Douglas, that rebellious banished lord. Ellen, who has been holding by the arm of Allenbane, and listening to the narration with emotions of terror and grief, falls fainting on the ground. She droops, she faints, and like the mountain snow, slides from the rock that gave it rest. Raising her, John of Brent and Bertram assisting. And now it melts to tears. What sudden gust or storm bowed the sweet snowdrop down? Ellen, having recovered, to Bertram, who is next to her. Soldier, you have a rugged outside but a feeling heart. Then bear this token to your prisoner. Giving a bracelet from her arm. To Malcolm. "'Twas his gift, his precious gift. "'He bound it on my arm, a talisman of faith. "'Tell him, I beg you, that I've wandered far to seek a father, "'that I knew but now, oh, bitter agony of brain and heart. "'I came to weep upon a lover's tomb. "'This bracelet I will give unto your lord. "'As for your message, trust me. "'But I fear these tears will choke the utterance of my tongue.' Exit up some stairs leading to the tower. A prisoner lies the noble-hearted Graham, and thou for me and mine in bondage pines. Ere this our captain doffed his morning robe and waits your presence. Quick, lead me to him, but first allow my heart to speak its thanks, and as a poor reward my slender purse be shared among the soldiers of the guard. The soldiers crowd round Ellen and receive her bounty, all but John of Brent, who stands apart. She goes up to him with a piece of gold and the purse. Lady, forgive a haughty English heart, if bluntly I refuse your proffered gold. Not but the empty purse shall be my share, which henceforth on my helmet is my crest. Putting it in his cap. My armor through the jeopardy of war. Enter Bertram. One poor request the noble Malcolm craves. 
that you would, on the instant, bless his sight, and cheer the captive in his prison walls. Oh, bring me to him. Makes the dungeons gloom with Malcolm by my side, nor pomp, nor courts, nor kings. Oh, ungrateful, Ellen, whither wouldst thou go? Twixt love and duty can I hesitate? To John of Brent. Oh, lead me, sir, where filial duty points, to where a daughter's love may save her sire. Exeunt Ellen, John of Brent, and Alan Vane. A roll of drums. Comrades, away! Put on your shining helms. The burghers hold their annual sports today. We must be there, for soldiers love the sight of hardy yeomen bending of their bows, of wrestlers struggling in the mimic war, or high-born tilters shivering of a spear. Shoulder your arms! On to the castle park, and see you scour the rabble from the ground. Bertram and the soldiers march out. Scene two. The castle park, the bells ringing, Fitz James and many nobles on horseback at the top of the stage. In the spaces between the wings, horsemen are placed to keep the ground clear. The sports commence with the Morris dancers. The dance over, the wrestling begins. A stranger, disguised as a peasant, vanquishes every opponent. Fitz James presents him with a ring. The bugles sound, and archers, properly habited, appear upon the stage and place the target. The stranger, after the rest have tried their skill, bears off the prize, a silver dart, which is given to him by Fitzjames. The trumpets sound, and a knight, on foot, challenges to combat with the broadsword. The stranger offers himself, but is spurned by the knight. Again he presents himself before the knight, who, enraged at the familiarity of a peasant, strikes him. The stranger snatches the sword from the hand of the knight and breaks it over his head. When some of the officers attendant upon the lords run to seize the peasant with drawn swords, he wields his sword and keeps them off. Back, back on your lives. Beware the Douglas. Throwing off his disguise. Yes, mark, proud slaves, the Douglas doomed of old and vainly sought for to atone your rage. A willing victim comes to crave for grace, not for himself but for his friends. What ho! The captain of the guard! The sports break off! And bear the traitor hence! Exhumed Fitzjames and the nobles, Douglas delivering up his sword to the officer. Here is my sword! Now to the dungeon! The mob break in upon the guards, who surround the prisoner and endeavor to rescue him. The, the Douglas, Douglas rescue. rescue! Douglas addressing the mob. Listen, misguided men, ere yet for me ye break the oath of fealty to your king. My life, and what is dearer far, my fame, I tender freely to my country's laws. Or think ye, if I suffer causeless wrong, that I for selfish vengeance would permit the public weal to suffer from your ire? Oh, no, believe me, that in yonder tower it will not soothe my sad captivity, to know those spears our foes should only dread were dyed for me in kindred gore, to know that patriots mourn insulted laws and curse the name of Douglas as the chief of brawls. Oh, let your patience wait my country's doom and keep your courage to defend your king. Exeunt. Scene three, the courtyard of the castle. Enter Ellen, Alan Bane, and John of Brent. Alan, t'was he. I saw his noble form. T'was Douglas, t'was my sire these eyes beheld, encircled with a band of armed men. I shrieked aloud. My father knew the voice and cast a look of pity on his child. I flew distracted towards him, but the guard denied the solace of a daughter's love. Inhuman monsters, to resist such claim. Firmly he marched amidst the glittering spears, And seemed the radiated orb a day, At whose approach the courtly satellites, Like twinkling stars, turned pale and shrunk from sight. Enter Fitzjames, running and kneeling to him. Oh, welcome, brave Sir James, I sought you now. 
Through scenes a danger I have ventured forth, a trembling suppliant for a father's life. Rise, lovely mourner, and demand thy suit. E'en now I saw the noble Douglas bound, dragged like the meanest culprit through the streets. Oh, grant my prayer, conduct me to the king, behold, to back my suit this cold and pledge. Ellen, my word of promise I will keep, my pledge redeem. But trust me, filial love, alone would be your passport to the king. Thy suit with royal James my voice shall aid. No tyrant he, though oft his better mood, is chafed to anger by domestic jars. Come, Ellen, come, in fitting bower of repose, till James, surrounded by his noble peers, ascend the throne to hear the suppliant's cause, or on the traitors to their country. Seal the doom of death. Ellen sighs. Nay, no desponding sigh, for hope, like sunbeams in an April's morn, should dry thy tears and brighten every cloud. Ah, oh, sir, how transient are such gleams of hope, for soon the prospect lowers to make us feel and deeper mourn the absence of the sun. Exeunt. My mistress safe, oh, give me but to see my honoured master's face his minstrel eye then let me share his captive lot and pay a vassal's homage to his lord we men of southern lineage little wreck a vassal's feudal homage to his lord but come old minstrel i will be your guide thy master and thy chieftain thou shalt see Exeunt. scene four a state prison roderick is discovered on a couch pale and wounded Enter John of Brent and Allenbane. Here, till the leech shall visit him again, thou mayest remain. Goes out, bolting the door after him. Allenbane going to the couch. Oh, my dear lord, Roderick. Roderick raising himself. What of the Lady Ellen? Of my clan? My mother? Douglas? Say who fought, who fled, who basely live, or who more bravely died. Ellen is safe, the Lady Margaret well, and for the Earl of Douglas we have hopes, as for thy clan. Never did minstrel sing of bolder combatants. Then tune thy harp. Strike it, and with the bard's inspiring lay, Fling me the picture of the battle's rage. I'll listen, till my fancy hear the clang of swords and bucklers, And the crash of spears. These grates, these prism walls, shall vanish then, And my free Spirit to the battle soar. Song of the Battle, Alan Bain accompanied on the harp. In the following song, instead of the usual symphonies between each verse, the music is to play notes expressive of that passion which every stanza has excited in the mind of Roderick. Hark, hark, the hostile shouts begin. Now westward rolls the battle's din. Bearing before them in their course, the thickest of the archer force, like wave with crest of sparkling foam, right onward did Clan Alpin come, shouting death or liberty. Music expressive of Roderick's passion. I heard the Saxons' lances crash, as when the whirlwind rends the ash. For life, for life, their flight they ply and shriek, and groan, and battle cry, with plaids and bonnets waving high, and broadswords clashing to the sky, with alpine shouts of victory. Music expressive, etc., etc. Revenge, revenge, the Saxons cried, freedom or death, the gales replied, clan alpine's best are backward born, where is their chieftain's bugle horn? 
where bothwell's lord and roderick bold both both alas in captive hold sunk in chains and slavery during the last four lines roderick's features and gestures become violently agitated at the last he starts from the couch tears the bandages from his wounds clenches his hands and sternly fixes his faded eyes upon vacancy falls back and expires without a groan music to the whole of the action there fell the foeman's dread the people's aid for thee of bothwell's exiled house the stay e'en in this prison's dreary gloom i'll strike the chords of woe for alpin's honoured pine lament allan bain accompanied on the harp what groan shall yonder valleys fill what shrieks of grief shall rend yon hill when mourns thy tribe thy battles done thy sword ungirt ere set of sun a braver breathes not of thy line o oh, woe for alpin's honoured pine allan bain mourned over the body a front scene closes him in scene the last the hall of audience king james in his regal habiliments seated on the throne attended by all his court in great splendour a flourish of drums and trumpets king james bid ellen douglas now approach our presence the lord-in-waiting goes out and immediately returns with ellen who with trembling step and downcast eye enters the presence at length she fearfully raises her head and recognizes fitzjames as the king she runs to the throne points to the ring and falls prostrate on the ground the king descends gently raises her and kisses her brow music till he speaks dismiss thy terrors thou hast naught to fear yes fair one yes the wandering knight fitzjames is scotland's king yet did he not assume a borrowed name or title to deceive for stirling's towers the name of snow dune owns and normans long have styled me james fitzjames oh mighty monarch might a daughter sue yes lovely ellen douglas has been wronged calmly we heard and judged the exile's course and bothwell's lord henceforth we gladly prize the surest friend and bulwark of our throne but charming infidel what clouds thy brow lord james of douglas lend thy wished for sight thou canst alone confirm this doubting maid enter douglas ellen and he rush into each other's arms thus lowly bending at our sovereign's feet we pay the willing homage of our hearts may loyalty repay a princely gift may every subject's bosom beat with zeal with love and gratitude as warm as ours ellen that little talisman of gold pledge of fitzjames faith thou still dost wear what other boon seeks ellen of her king ellen irresolute in her request my liege that you would gracious pardon give to him who groans in chains to, to roderick too fruitless thy prayer fruitless my grace would be e'en now a messenger in woe dispatched brought news that roderick was no more ellen weeping <laughs> dread sir pardon that i should grieve that james foe is numbered with the dead but mighty king when courtly friends forsook us he it was who sheltered douglas in the trying hour i know his heart and hand have shard his chair and freely would my fairest earldom give to call him back to life but speak thy wish hast thou no other captive friend to save ellen holds down her head nay then Fitz James's pledge has lost its force, and stubborn justice holds her turn to reign. Mounting the throne. Malcolm, come forth. 
Enter Malcolm, who kneels. For thee, no suppliant sues, for thee, who nurtured underneath our smile, hast paid our care with treason to the state, dishonouring thus thy loyal name, receive the full reward of thy sovereign's vengeance claims, chains and a warder for the grammar. The king hastily descends the throne, takes off the chain of gold that encircles his own neck, places it round Malcolm's, and gently drawing him to Ellen, lays the clasp in her hand. The lovers kneel and thank the king. Tis thus a monarch makes his power revered, his person honoured and his throne obeyed, when he can say with heaven's potential voice, Arise, sad suffering virtue, and rejoice. Flourish of drums and trumpets, and the curtain falls. The End End of Act Three of Lady of the Lake End of The Lady of the Lake by Edmund John Eyre